Okay, so I want to thank the organizers for the invitation. It's surely a great pleasure uh, to be here. So the thing I'll talk about is uh, my ongoing work with Fernando Marquez and more specifically the collaborations we had with uh, Yevgeny Lukumovic and um, Kairi. So I'll motivate the problem, state the conjecture, state the theorem, and then I'll prove the, the theorem. So the motivation for this type of questions goes back, I would say, right to the beginning of the area. And so this was uh, original posed by Poincaré. And the question that Poincaré asked was whether we can always find a, a, map, a closed geodesic on uh, any two sphere. So Poincaré was actually only looking at the convex um, uh, spheres. And this turned out to be a foundational, foundational question in the field, in mathematics in general, because uh, closed geodesics um, for two spheres, and in general in manifolds, they have uh, two, two distinct uh, points of view. On one hand, you can see them as closed, as periodic orbits to some Hamiltonian flow, in this case the geodesic flow, or you can see them as critical points for some functional. So the question that Poincaré was asking is really, do Hamiltonian flows in general have periodic orbits, or do functionals in general have uh, critical points? And I would say that, you know, this motivated dynamical systems, but also Morse theory, variational methods in, in geometry, and a lot of mathematics was uh, started from, from this question. So the, f the answer to this came from Birkhoff in 1912, and he, he indeed showed that every two-sphere admits a closed geodesic, and the method he used uh, was variational. It's called the min-max method. The, um, then, some years later, uh, Lushnik and Schnirlman, and um, Grayson also had an important contribution here in 89 because he did the curve shortening flow part. So what they showed is that on every two-sphere, we can actually find three simple uh, closed geodesics. And this result is optimal on some ellipsoid. So on the ellipsoid, it's easy to see what the geodesic should be. So if this is an ellipsoid with, I with its axis, then uh, the closed geodesics will be, the simple ones, it will be this one, that one, and the third coming from this guy here. And we can actually find ellipsoids where um, there are no other three simple closed geodesics besides this, and every other geodesic will have arbitrarily large length and lots of self-intersections. Okay. And so um, then from the point of view of existence, there's also an important result due to Pugh and Robinson, and what they showed is that for a generic set of metrics on any given surface, the set of all closed geodesics is, is dense. So here, they proved this using the Hamiltonian uh, point of view. They treat geodesics as being periodic uh, orbits to Hamiltonian flow. And um, Kairi, one of our co-authors, co two years ago, he improved this result from C to generic to, to C infinity. Uh, generic, and he did this y using again the periodic point, point of view, but also using um, a previous result in embedded contact or homology due to Hutchison and some uh, co-authors. Co so the, the story of, of course, one that is natural to ask, can you go from C to generic to every possible metric? And this was answered by Franks and, and Bangert, where they showed that every two sphere indeed has infinitely many closed geodesics, but of course they wouldn't know whether they are dense um, or not. Nancy Hingston also had an important uh, contribution here. And, and both in, in this theorem, so Franks uses the Hamiltonian point of view, and Bangert uses the variational uh, point of view, and both are complementary there. The, um, so 
I, I did this extremely short survey of the story of closed geodesics, but this is a, a central chapter in differential geometry, which had really brilliant work from many, many people. I just cited some of them, which are, of course, Grommel Meyer, Gromov, Klingenberg, Margulis, who studied them under negative uh, curvature and showed that they are equidistributed. And, and also, this is an a, a extremely rich topic in, in, in uh, mathematics. So now, of course, in the same way that geodesics, they are critical points for the, either the length or the energy functional, we, we can choose one. Minimal hypersurface, they are critical points for the area functional. And so if we, now mi minimal high hypersurface, they are also uh, central in uh, geom not only geometry, but of course relativity and a lot of other uh, fields. But if we step back to the 70s, the only known examples would be three or four of them, even on R3. I think it was the catenoid, the plane, and the, um, the helicoid. So there was an important result here due to Lawson in, in 1970. And so what Lawson showed was that for the round three sphere, then you can find a minimal embedded surface of every, every possible genus. Okay? And then after this, then if you assume the space has a lot of symmetries, then of course now we know that in R3 there are a lot of complete embedded minimal surface. And if you assume symmetry on the space, you can always find. Um, we have some techniques to find um, many of, of those. So Yao, in 1982, he put this uh, list of open problems in uh, geometry, and in this they are divided by sections. And the first problem for the minimal surface sections, and he put it as a conjecture, is that he conjectured that every closed three manifold should admit an infinite number of distinct um, minimal surface. So um, I will review now a bit the progress that has been made on this uh, conjecture. So I restate the conjecture there. And then um, I, I should make this. Of course, when the ambient manifold is rich in topology, so for instance, if it's an uh, n-dimensional torus, then you can use direct minimization to just find lots of a distinct minimal hypersurface because, uh, for instance, if you do the three torus, the H2 in homology is very large, so you, you can sure, you, you can for sure minimize on many distinct homology classes and get uh, infinitely many uh, distinct minimal embedded uh, surface. So the problem becomes much trickier when there's no topology at all, for instance, when it's the three sphere. Okay. Because then there's nothing you can minimize. And so the first result in that direction, this was um, Pitt's thesis, but also Shane Simon, they had a contribution there to extend the regularity for higher dimensions. And the way the result can be stated is that if you pick any closed manifold, then for sure, any closed remaining manifold, then for sure you can find one closed minimal embedded hypersurface, which will be smooth outside a set of uh, co-dimension seven. Okay. So um, what the result is saying is that for sure there's always one. Right? And then um, not much progress was, was made for 30 years. And then uh, some years ago, jointly with Fernando, we show that on every uh, closed remaining manifold, we can actually find n plus 1, closed minimal embedded uh, hypersurface, which are smooth outside a set of co-dimension 7. And if we are willing to put some um, curvature condition on G, we improve this result. And we show that um, we restricted ourselves to the, to the case where the dimension of the ambient manifold was neither too small nor too large, just because we didn't want to uh, have to deal with singularities. Okay. So if the ambient dimension is between 3 and 7, and if the manifold has a metric with positive Ricci, then we can indeed find infinitely many closed, uh, minimal smooth uh, embedded uh, hypersurface. And two years later, Shinzu, he, he removed the dimension restriction there. And so um, what, what he showed is that even for higher dimensions, you can, you'll be able to find infinitely many a closed minimal embedded hypersurface, which will be smooth outside a set of co-dimension seven. 
And this was pretty much uh, all that was known regarding, regardless the Yao conjecture. And so the result I want to talk about is my uh, new work with uh, Fernando and Kairi. And uh, we show the following. So again, we don't want to have to deal with a singular set just to make our life easier. But you know, that's no big restriction because at least we can deal every manifold from dimension 3 to 7. Okay? And so our result says that for a C infinity generic set of matrix on any given manifold, the set of all closed embedded minimal hypersurface e is dense, meaning if you pick any open set U, you, you'll be able to find a closed embedded minimal hypersurface that passes through that set U. Okay? So in particular, we solved the Yau conjecture for generic matrix. Okay. Okay. So what I want to say now is, uh, of course, I will um, dedicate the rest of the talk to the explaining the main concepts behind the, um, the, the proof. But uh, let, let me say that, so to, to put things a bit more into perspective, then um, the only available technique one has to find minimal embedded hypersurface are variational methods because the Hamiltonian, you know, we cannot, or at least as of now, there's no interpretation of uh, minimal embedded hypersurface as being some periodic orbit, some Hamiltonian system. So it doesn't seem to make sense in this uh, scenario. So the only available methods are variational, and the problem is that from the variational point of view, a minimal surface or the same minimal surface with multiplicity, I chose three there, but it should apply for any positive integer, these count as distinct elements. These count as distinct critical points. But on the other hand, they do not correspond to the distinct minimal hypersurface because I just pick a one I already knew and multiply <coughs> by an integer there. But the variational point of view does not distinguish between this one and uh, that one just says they are distinct, or it does distinguish between that and that one, just says they are distinct um, uh, critical points, when in reality, they are not. So as it happens, uh, or as it all, always happens, if we make some sizable, imp uh, some sizable progress on what was known before, it means that we need to have some new input, some new idea coming back into the, the area. And in, in, in our case, the new ingredient we bring, it's this uh, Gromov's, um, it's a Vylaw for the volume spectrum, which was conjectured by Gromov and was proven last year by Lukomovich, Fernando, and um, uh, myself. So the, the, the existence of this, we call this Gromov's Vylaw, the existence of this Gromov's Vylaw in combination with variational methods is what allow us to show that minimal embedded hypersurface will be dense for a generic matrix. So the plan of the talk is to explain what is the Vylaw for the volume spectrum, give uh, one idea about the proof, and then I'll explain how the Vylaw implies that theorem. Okay. So um, now let's instead of <laughs> So before I talk about Gromov's Vylaw, let's talk about just the standard Vylaw, right? So this uh, makes a connection with what was said on, on the first talk. And so um, let me just do a, um, a little brief introduction here. So the setup is the same, just take some n plus 1 closed remaining manifold. And now um, I look at the space. So W12, this is the space of functions with bounded energy and bounded L2 norm. <coughs> okay. So now uh, I'll present the Vylaw, or I'll, I'll present the definition of the pith eigenvalue in a slightly different way than you're probably used to it, just because it's going to be useful for the next slide. So um, I look at the space W12, I remove the zero element, and now I make an equivalence class where I identify a function with all its constant multiples, and I denote the resulting space by P. Okay. So, you know, intuitively, W12 is a Hilbert space. So we should think as being homeomorphic to R infinity, if it makes any sense. If I remove the origin, 
and identify a function with its multiple, then the space I should get should be something homomorphic to RP infinity. Okay? If I do this on a finite dimensional vector space, then I do get a finite dimensional projective space, right? So this is the, the intuition here. And of course, a P plus one uh, uh, plane in W12, now it's going to project to a P dimensional projective space on um, the, this space, which we'll call uh, curl, curl P. So I'll, I'll state the definition of the spectrum in terms of these um, space of equivalence classes instead of W12 as we usually uh, see it. Okay? So the p eigen value is given by the following uh, expression. We take a p projective space in the space of all in W12 with this equivalence class. And now for this projective space, I pick an equivalence class of functions there and I maximize the Rayleigh quotient, right? <coughs> so here I pick an equivalence class. Here I apply the Rayleigh quotient to a given representative. But of course, this is well defined because the Rayleigh quotient is scale invariant. If I apply on a function f or if I evaluate the Rayleigh quotient on lambda times f, I get the very same value. So this only depends on the equivalence class. And this is exactly the min-max definition for the pitta I, eigenvalue. Okay, that's how it was constructed. And so the, <clears throat> the most fundamental result one learns about the, the sequence of pitta eigenvalues, this is called the spectrum of the manifold, is that as p goes to infinity, the asymptotic behavior of the spectrum depends only on the volume of M. So what we saw in the first talk of the morning then was a more detailed, refined analysis of what are the second and third order terms there. Right? But or, so the, um, this was proven originally by uh, uh, Weil in 1911, but his proof only works for domains of space. And then many years later, uh, Min Minakshi, Shudaram, and Playal, they, prove, they gave a proof that applies for closed manifolds, and uh, their proof is based on the asymptotic expansion for the uh, trace of the heat kernel, as we saw it in, in the morning. So, vile proof is purely variational, but the second, you know, this more general proof uses things which are very much related with the linear, linear theory. And, uh, and in, in this case, because one can compute the spectrum of highly symmetric examples like the sphere or, or, a, or a square or a torus, then we can know what the universal constant is, right? We just choose this on a sphere and compute the, this constant there because for, for the sphere we know exactly what all these values are. Right? So. <clears throat> So now I want to talk about, so this is the vial spectrum. I want to uh, explain what is the volume spectrum, okay? So the, the idea is, is the same. So I need a space. I need the space to have lots of projective spaces. And I need a functional on the space because these were the three things that uh, we had on the previous slides to be able to get started on the vial spectrum. So the space I'm going to use is the space of, um, uh, so Robert, he spoke, this, yeah, he spoke about this space uh, yesterday. So uh, I'm looking at the space of co-dimension one, mod two cycles in a given manifold, such that these cycles are the boundary of something. So if you're not so familiar with this language of geometric measure theory, you can just think of the space I'm using as the space of all boundaries of regions in the ambient manifold. I, I put this restriction because I want this to be the connected. Uh, so this quantity, this requiring t to be the boundary of something, it's there to make sure that t is homologically trivial. So I want to work on the connected component of zero. Okay? So, but this is, the, this is the base space. And this space has a, a topology one puts there called the flat topology, which uh, Robert also uh, spoke about there. So, <clears throat> Almgren, in his thesis, he showed that he computed the homotopy type of this space, and he showed that it's weakly homotopic to RP infinity, just like the space of 
functions if we remove the origin and make an equivalence class there. So <coughs> if the space is weakly homotopic to RP infinity, then it means it has this, the same cohomology ring as RP infinity, in which case we know that there's only one uh, generator. So let me write that. So <coughs> if we do this, if we compute the cohomology ring, coefficient z2, if we do singular cohomology, elements in z2, then these are just polynomials with the uh, z2 coefficients with only one uh, generator. Right? <coughs> so, so this is our space, and the space has, has topology. So this is the analog. This space is the analog of this space there. Okay, so now we have topology on this large space, so we can talk about um, p-projective spaces, right? And so this is the concept of a, a p-sweep out. So if we take a continuous map from some, uh, in the theory we use cubical complex. If we, we, we look at continuous map from a cubical complex into uh, the space of mod two cycles, uh, co-dimension co one mod two cycles, and we say this space is a p sweep out if we take the generator, we raise it to the pth power, and if we pull back that with the map uh, 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 phi, then we, we require to get a non-trivial element uh, uh, there. So you should think as, um, you should think as phi as just a map from uh, there, of course, the, um, the space x can be uh, anything. But typically, we can think of it as just being a map from a p-projective space into there, which is, um, is non-trivial. And what this means is that, in some sense, its image should detect the pth power of this form. So if this were, uh, of course, it doesn't make sense. But we can think of it as the pth power as being the volume form of some p-projective space, which hits inside this space. And what we are requiring is to make sure that this map is detecting this pith power. Okay. So that's the idea. So this is our replacement for p projective planes. Okay. And then, so these ideas were due to uh, uh, Gromov. And so then um, he, he did this in the 80s. So for every integer p, then Gromov introduced this sequence, the volume spectrum, which is defined the following way. So I take a p sweep out, and then I maximize the volume functional on that p sweep out, and I minimize among every possible p sweep out. So this is the analog for the vial spectrum where I'm replacing the Rayleigh quotient by the volume functional. I'm replacing W12 by the space of mod two cycles, and I'm replacing uh, planes by uh, p sweep outs. But the idea is the is the very same one. Okay, <clears throat> and so um, Gromov, in the same paper that he introduced this notion of the volume spectrum, he studied his growth, and he showed that you can find a universal, you, you can find a constant that depends on the ambient manifold and on the metric, such that the pth power grows like the n plus one root, such that the, the these elements, sorry, we, we denote this by the p width, such that the pth width grows like the n plus 1 root of p for all p in n. So this is same thing as saying that the, like studying the growth of the pth eigenvalue without worrying about uh, whether the limit exists or not. So Gromov, he first did in, in 86, and then uh, Larry, many years later, he proved a more general version. So uh, Larry Good, he, he does not restrict himself to just co-dimension one cycles. He studies cycles of any uh, co-dimension, and he gets the equivalent uh, uh, statement there. Okay. So, motivated by um, <coughs> by I guess the standard Vi law, then Gromov he conjectured that the volume spectrum that he introduced should also obey a Vi law. So what this means is that there's a universal constant such that you, if you divide this p width by this growth power, then we're going to get that universal constant times, of course, just the volume because this quantity scales. It's not scale invariant, so you have to put something there reflecting the way the scale 
the scaling of this uh, uh, quantity. And so um, last year, jointly with uh, uh, Lukmovic, Marcus and myself, we, we showed that the gram, these Gromov's Vila holds for every space where the space may or may not uh, have a boundary. So um, I, will, I will say some words about the, the proof just to uh, highlight the sort of techniques one, one uses. And so the, I, I guess the first thing one observes is that we were able to prove the Weil law without knowing exactly what the constant is. So Weil, of course, he computes the Weil law and he uses heavily the fact that he knows what the constant is a priori because he uses heavily the fact that he can compute the, the spectrum for uh, cubes. Okay? In, in our case, one does not know how to compute this constant and so this was a bit of a, of a uh, surprise at least uh, to us. So now the proof is divided in, again, the crucial thing is uh, what, you know, what technique you're going to use to, to prove the, the result, right? If we do the analogy with the Weil law, when the manifold is a region of space, then we can use just variational methods to do it. This was what Weil did, and this is what we do as well. So when our uh, manifold is just a region of space, say like a ball, then the results follow from, follow from variational principles, namely from a super additivity formula for the p-width in terms of the domain u. And you can prove this using the same type of techniques that Gromov he introduced and that, that later Larry Good uh, explored. Of course, the, when m is, a, is not a, a region of space but just some closed manifold, for instance, like a sphere, then this method breaks in the same way that it breaks for the Vila and in the same way that it took maybe 40 years more to get the Vila for the closed manifolds. Right? So uh, using these variational techniques, we, we can only know that the limit is bounded by a universal constant. Right? And you, you can bound from one way because you can easily fit cubes inside the closed manifold but you cannot fit a closed manifold inside cubes of the same dimension, right? The thing does not make, make sense. Okay. So I will explain now uh, how, what is the idea to prove this Vila when, the, when M is just some closed manifold in space because we, we did have to you know, crack our heads a bit here to get this right. So, um, so the idea to handle the general case is, is the, the following. So I take my manifold M, it could just be a, a sphere, in which case the Vila was also not, not known, this Gromov's Vila. And so our, our method is to, we break the sphere, we divide the sphere into lots of regions which are almost Euclidean. So I could imagine dividing, the, dividing my sphere into lots and lots of, of cubes, they, they will have just some minimal overlap, it's not a big problem. And then I reassemble these cubes in space to, in order to get a region in Euclidean space of the same volume as M. So I just chop, I, I literally chop it up in cubes and put them back in Euclidean space in any way we want just to make sure that, that it's connected, right? And the reason why I do this is because for this guy I know the Vila holds. I want to conclude it for this one, right? And then, and it's on this part of the argument that using mod 2 cycles becomes crucial because there's going to be a lot of cancellations. I think Robert also mentioned that, that issue. If we were to do this with integer coefficients, we wouldn't know uh, how, how to, to do it. So the upper bound really comes from using a lot of the structure about mod 2 cycles. So now, given a relative uh, cycle uh, T in U, for instance, a relative cycle means that now U has a boundary. So T will be a cycle whose boundary lies in the boundary of U, something like this. I choose a cycle there, and now I want to find another cycle on the closed manifold, which will have no boundary, and the property is that the volume of this new cycle will not be much higher than the volume of the old cycle. So actually it will not be more than uh, the volume of the boundary of all this subdivision uh, we made. Initially, this is large, but because eventually these guys will go to infinity, this term will be ineligible, right? So uh, how can we do this? So um, 
I hope you can see it. There's a color code there. So um, I go, I look at the way the original cycle intersects every cube. And uh, there on every cube, I complete it just to be uh, on a cycle, meaning we'll have no boundary, right? So I look at this red part, and then I add that piece, that piece, and that piece to get a cycle. I do the same thing on this cube there, on that cube there. And so I, I can add pieces of the boundary to get now uh, good cycles on each cube. And now I just put them back on the original manifold, and I don't even worry about the, the order. Right? If I do this, of course, I'm gaining a bit more on the area, but what I gain is never higher than, than this. If it, many of them will share the same boundary, but because it's mod two cycles, there are a lot of cancellations which make sure that this term is uniform, independent of the, of the cycle t. Okay? So this is an absolutely crucial point. And then the punchline is that we can do this in a continuous way, meaning if we have a continuous family, a p continuous, a continuous family of p parameters of cycles, of these relative cycles, I can construct another um, family of p parameters on the closed manifold, and um, I get that the p width for the closed manifold is bounded by the p width of the, um, this region in space plus something which is bounded. This term is of this order, right? But now this is fixed. And so, of course, when I divide by the growth power and make the limit go to infinity, I get that this asymptotic limit will be less or equal than that asymptotic limit, and that we nailed out already using the variational uh, methods. Okay? So this is in a very a broad stroke the, the basic uh, idea to get this uh, Vi law. Okay? So now I already explained what is the volume spectrum. I explained what is the Vi law. I need to make the connection with the theory of minimal surface. Okay. And so this connection is, is done using what's what we call uh, min-max theory. Or it's generally, it's known as min-max theory. So um, using the almgren pitts min-max theory for homotopy classes and the Morse index bounds for min-max hypersurface that Fernando and I proved maybe three or four years ago, then we can show the following theorem. So uh, restrict ourselves to the dimension between 3 and 7 just because we don't want to deal with singularities. And then the theorem is that for every integer p, there's some close embedded minimal hypersurface with possible multiplicities which realizes um, the width. So, um, so let me make uh, several comments um, about this. So the first comment is that this does not follow from the theory left by Almgren and Pitts, because Almgren and Pitts, they always work on a fixed homotopy class, and this P with, they are defined in terms of cohomology classes. So it has a much larger class of competitors than for the Almgren Pitts minimax theory. So if one were to use only Almgren Pitts minimax theory, then what the result would say is that we can find a sequence of embedded minimal hypersurface whose area converges to the p width. But of course, even if you have a sequence of embedded minimal hypersurface with bounded area, they might converge to something singular, right? It's easy to construct examples just on, on the tree sphere. On the other hand, Fernando and I, we proved that when, even when one works on a homotopy class, this minimal embedded hypersurface one gets from the Almgren Pitt min max theory, they have a uniform bound on their Morse index. And so, if they have a uniform bound on their Morse index, now when we take the limit, we know that we're going to convert to something that's nice, smooth, and embedded, and that's how we want to um, obtain this uh, result. So, the second comment, which was something I alluded to in the beginning, is that this sigma p can be, of course, twice some sigma prime and three times some other minimal surface where they will have disjoint uh, supports. And as I said in the beginning, it's the issue of these existence of multiplicities that makes uh, the existence of embedded minimal hypersurface to be um, a, a hard problem. Because from the variational point of view, all these elements are distinct, while if this is the case, they are obviously not. And then the other comment is that using this theorem, one can at least compute the p-width for um, some symmetric spaces. So 
the ones for the three sphere, they, they do mimic a bit the eigenvalues. And then, of course, as p gets large, the problem becomes much harder and it's uh, hard to compute. So the first four width of the three sphere, they are four pi. Then the next three. So this, L, this always has to be realized by the volume of some minimal hypersurface. Here is the, the equator. The next three, this is the, the Clifford torus. And um, so this was done by a student of, of mine. And of course, to, to know this, um, he had to use these, uh, what we call the conformal families that they were introduced by Fernando and myself. And then uh, the eight width, we know that it's between, uh, it's bigger than two pi square, but smaller than eight pi. And of course, computing that is probably related with solving the Wilmore conjecture for genus two surface. And I would say the conjecture is that the eighth or the ninth width, it should be real realized by the area of the loss and genus two minimal surface, okay? Which we don't know explicitly what it is, <laughs> okay? So now, <clears throat> so now we have all the ingredients. I'll, I'll explain what is the, how to prove the theorem from the Vi law and min max, okay? So the theorem, just recalling uh, again, is that for a generic set of metrics, the set of all minimal embedded hypersurface is, is dense. So um, let's see, introduce a tiny bit of notation. So given a metric G, I denote by MG, M is from minimal, M of G, this denotes the set of all minimal embedded hypersurface with respect to G. A priori, we know that it has at least N plus one elements, but that could be it. So a priori, it could be a finite set, right? And now we fix some open set U on M, and we look at um, the set of all metrics, such that for that given metric, I can find a minimal embedded hypersurface that intersects U, okay? So this could be empty for almost every metric, okay? And so um, I also require that the minimal hypersurface that passes through the set U is a non-degenerate. So non-degenerate, it means that if we do second variation, there, there will be no non-trivial element in the, um, in the kernel of the second uh, variation. So the fact that it's non-degenerate, it means that this set is open. So it could be empty, <laughs> but if, if it's non-empty, then at least, we, well, uh, uh, the empty set is also open, but each time you pick a metric G there, then for a tiny neighborhood of, of these metrics, they will also satisfy this property. And the reason we know this, it's because of these non-degeneracy conditions. So if we have a set U, if I have a minimal surface that cuts that set U, then if I wiggle a bit the metric, if the minimal surface is non-degenerate, then I can wiggle the minimal surface to get a new minimal surface for the new metric that still passes through the set U. So the set is U. I want to make sure that it's dense. Because if this set is dense, then I take a countable intersection of open dense sets, and that's generic, okay? So the first remark is that it suffices to see that the falling set is dense. And the falling set is just the set of all metrics for which there's a minimal surface that intersects the set U. So this set is a tiny bit bigger than that one, but their closure is the same. So if I pick a minimal surface, for some given metric G, and if the minimal surface is degenerate, then we can do a tiny perturbation of the metric G, which makes that minimal surface um, non-degenerate. We can even do that with a tiny conformal deformation. So this set is bigger, but the closure is the same, so we might as well work with the bigger set. Right? So, I will, like, so the next slide will be the last one. It's going to have four steps, and I will explain why this set has to be dense. Right? Okay, so let's just remind the, the notation. Um, M of G, this is the set of all embedded minimal hypersurface with respect to G. And G of U, this is the set of all metrics. So uh, let's say raise here. Okay. So there's my manifold M. And this is my set U. And um, G of U, this is the set of all metrics for which I can find a minimal surface that cuts um, U, okay, that passes through, through U, okay. 
So of course, the proof is by uh, contradiction. And so suppose that the set is not dense. So what this means is that I can find an open set in the space of all metrics, which avoids uh, this set. Right? So uh, I pick an element in this open set, and then I consider uh, the following one parameter family of, of um, uh, metrics. So what I do is I, I pick a positive function with compact support defined just on my set u, and I do a little bump on the metric there. So if I were to make a picture, so le let's suppose that our set u is like this, and the g of t would just make a tiny bump, right? This is the family g of t. So when g equals 0 is like this, then as t increases, I just make a tiny bump there. Of course, because the set is open, I can assure that all this one parameter family is still within the open set, right? Because I can make this as small as I want by choosing the size of the bump as small as I want. So no big deal there, right? So <clears throat> let's unwind what does it mean for this one parameter family to be in the open set V, okay? So what it means is that for all these metrics, there's no minimal embedded hypersurface that passes through U. But all these metrics G of T, they coincide with G outside the set U, right? Because I, I just did a tiny bump on the interior of U. So what this means is that the minimal surface with respect to the metric G of T and with respect to the metric G will be the same. Because no minimal surface cuts you and the metrics only differ inside you, okay? So I change the metrics, but the minimal surface I have not changed. They all, all remain there, right? <coughs> okay. Then <coughs> the third step is to say that there's an important theorem of Brian White which, which uh, allows us to pick the, the initial metric to be bumpy. Bumpy means that um, every minimal uh, every embedded minimal hypersurface will be uh, non-degenerate, meaning you'll never find uh, elements in the kernel of the second uh, variation. The advantage of doing that, it, it's because there's, a, there's a, a result here of, there's why I call this Ben Sharp compactness theorem. So Ben Sharp, he was a postdoc of, of mine many years ago in, in, in London. So in, in the case where the metric is bumpy, what Ben Sharp proved is that the set of all um, minimal embedded hypersurface is countable, okay, when the metric is bumpy. So what this means is that I have this one parameter family of uh, metrics, the minimal surface do not change, and they are, it's a countable set, okay? So if it's a countable set, we can look at the way the P width changes in terms of the parameter T, and this is, a, it is, this is a Lipschitz continuous function. The width, in the same way that the spectrum is Lipschitz continuous, the volume spectrum is also Lipschitz continuous in terms of the metric. And um, so this function is continuous in terms of the metric. If we only have a countable number of minimal, uh, if we only have a countable set of minimal embedded hypersurface, because the image of this lies in a linear combination with uh, positive integers of the volumes of elements we live in a countable set, the image of this lives in a countable set, independently of t. And now if you have a continuous function whose image lies on a countable set, the function has to be uh, constant, okay? And so we get that this function is constant, okay? Now we really get the punchline, okay? And the punchline is that the volume of the final guy is bigger than the volume of the initial one. And by the gromov vila that we proved with Yevgeny and Fernando, I know that asymptotically this guy will grow, will have a bigger value than that guy. So there's some integer p where the p width for the final metric has to be bigger than the p width for the initial metric. And so it's impossible for this function to be continuous, which means that the set has to be dense. And so the set of all minimal embedded hypersurface is dense for generic metrics. OK, I did only in 50 minutes, <laughs> as I promised to Ziller. <laughs> so I'll just uh, stop here. Okay.
Les autres, c'est le the tree sphere. Uh, do you know uh, the genus of the minimal surfaces? Okay, so for the round tree sphere, we know. I mean, we know the no, genus no, of the Lawson construction. No, no. Uh, I have a conjecture ah. that the genus grows like p. Yeah. So because um, this is an important point. So you know, so. A lot of the way we got ourselves here, literally, we just follow what w the intuition one gets from the vile spectrum and argues the other, the other way, right? So the pth minimal surface should have index p. Mm -hmm. And then I would hope that if you have a minimal surface of index p with the space of positive Ricci, then the genus should be proportional to p. Because the index p, you know, having something with Morse index p, it means that you have p directions in which you can decrease the area. The picture I have in my mind is pinx, which you can. So if you have pinx, you can pinch them and decrease the area in p of them. So you should have genus p, but that, that's not proven. Yeah. But that is the hope. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, so if you look at <coughs> this almost p as a sequence, is the asymptotic behavior, or if, for example, we can consider the say the zeta function as for this sequence. So does it? Yeah, so, so zeta function tells the like the geometry behind like that. Okay, so so of course we can have a zeta function <laughs> associated with it, just the same way that we can have a zeta function with the spectrum. The problem is okay, so a difference from the spectrum, and this I would love to know, is that I don't know what the second order term is. Okay? Nor do I know what the optimal constant is. So these properties become more useful if we could nail down the second term. In the expansion, but that's a line of, of, of research, of, of course. Yeah. What, so, what kind of technique, you know, will potentially provide to keep that the second term that in your mind? So, so far none, right? <laughs> so, so, so the heat kernel, the trace, the heat kernel, I've, it doesn't make sense in the case of minimal hypersurface. You could try to think in terms of bracket flow, but even bracket flow doesn't seem to be helpful here because the bracket flow is not continuous in the flat topology. So if you have two guys which are initially close to each other, if you run bracket flow, they can be farther apart. So I don't think bracket flow will do it. Of course, I would love to know that. Yeah, I would love to know that. I'll, I would love to know what is the analog with this uh, trace of the heat kernel. I cannot make product of eigenfunctions. I cannot make product of minimal surface. Maybe there's some regularization one could use there. That's what I, what I would think. You can use some regularized kernel and try to do that and take it as a limit. So, yeah. Have you any guess for the constant? Uh, we, uh, yeah, I do, I do, I do. It should be, I, I do, and I compute it. It should be the, um, it should be the one, um, so, okay, so the guess, I would, so the guess is based on, on the following. If I do this on the tree sphere, asymptotically, this minimal surface, they should approach nodal sets of the eigenfunctions. And as soon, if we assume this, then you can get the optimal constant from um, Crofton formula. So the guess would be the one that comes from looking at zeros of homogeneous uh, harmonic polynomials restricted to the tree sphere, okay. Yeah. So that gives you an educated guess. I guess that's the optimal one. I don't know how to prove it. Yeah. Any other questions? I have a question. Uh, do you think there are any counterexamples in general? For the, for the density? Yes. The, um, uh, <laughs> I didn't think about that one. The, for the closed Jurassic problem. What is the it's a, it's a, it's like, it's like, it's a, it's a lose-lose situation because of, of the following. Of course, we know that generically there will be no counterexamples. So we have to work with them, example we can work with. All the examples we work with, just by the fact that we can work with them, they're gonna have symmetries. And as soon as they have symmetries, the denseness is there because you can just start applying symmetries and just rotate things. So I have no idea about that. Do, pe you know, do people know that for? For the closed Jurassic? I don't know. Oh, yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Is that known? Symmetrical is two such that yeah. uh, with an open set that with no closed risk was true. That's really possible. For negative curve is not true, right? Of course. So people know that, yeah. For puzzles with curve, yeah. I don't know. It should exist. I don't know how to Yeah, yeah, yeah.
Yeah, I don't know. Any other questions? Let's thank the speaker again.